welcome to Beat Around the Barn. This topic is, should vegans be guardians to cats? Um, and this one is a real near and dear topic to me. I have two cats, Santiago and Sofia Molina, and they are my babies. Uh, I always joke that I gave birth to them and I don't care if anybody says otherwise, okay? Um, so this is a really tough topic for me. I always struggle with what do I feed them, but yet also how do I ensure giving them the best possible life that's natural to them, you know? Yeah, I think this is a really tough topic for all vegans mm. uh, because this is an ethical issue. Mm -hmm. And our goal as vegans is to cause no animal harm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that makes this, this a very intricate and complicated mm -hmm. topic. There's no easy answers. No, no. So one thing that we have here to help us out, uh, we have a book that has been written and published recently called The Clean Pet Food Revolution. Um, Co-authors are Dr. Ernie Ward, vegan veterinarian, um, Alice Oven, and then also to Ryan Bethencourt. Uh, you all may know from our previous episodes that we have a a board member in the UK, his name is James. Well, James had the opportunity to sit down with Alice Oven, one of the co-authors, and interview her uh, on the book. They make a lot of amazing arguments. First of all, they unpack the ethical part of things, uh, but then also to talk about some possible upcoming solutions. Uh, so do stick around, listen to the interview, and then after that, Ella and I uh, sit down with our uh, very beloved volunteer, Belle, and we're gonna have a great roundtable discussion, okay? So stick around and listen. Well, hello, I'm James. If you don't know me, I'm the third uh, board member of Hogs and Kisses Farm Sanctuary, and with me today is Alice, who is gonna talk to us about vegan pet food. Um, so Alice, uh, we're really grateful to you for coming to join us, uh, massively appreciate it. I was wondering if you could start us off with a bit about yourself and how you became the co-author of The Clean Pet Food Revolution. Thanks. Yeah, so thank you so much for having me here. Um, yeah, I massively appreciate you inviting me to join the discussion. Um, and I'm also really pleased that this discussion is happening because obviously it's such an yeah. important topic. Um, so a bit about me. I work full time for an academic publisher called Taylor and Francis in the UK. Um, I work on a senior commissioning editor for life science and veterinary books, which basically means that I take, um, I work with authors to take their ideas and sort of shape them into, I guess, essentially published physical books, um, normally aimed at researchers, uh, academics, professionals and students. Um, and then in my free time, when I'm not doing that, I work as a, a freelance animal ethics writer. And I've got a particular right. interest in companion animal ethics, mm -hmm. so the human-animal bond, yeah. um, and also pet nutrition and what we feed our cats and dogs. And that's sort of how the book came about. Um, the book's called a Clean pet, The Clean Pet Food Revolution, How Better Pet Food Will Change the World. And it came out right. in 2020. Um, oh, I've very also, recent. Yeah, yeah, recently. Um, and I uh, also just recently completed an MSc in Animal Welfare, Science, Ethics and Law at University of Winchester, which I studied alongside wow. um, my publishing course, my publishing, my publishing job even. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's, that really obviously fed into the book as well. So that all kind of came together at the right time. And in terms of, I guess, how the book came about, um, I think it was really a continuation of my the journey that I'd been on with my own companion animal, my dog JD. Right. Um, my husband and I have been vegan for a number of years and we were feeling, I guess, increasingly uncomfortable with feeding my dog meat products mm. um, as we weren't bringing animal products into the house at all for ourselves. It yeah. Just, yeah, it just felt really strange um, and just more and more kind of awkward and I think I was I was kind of looking for high welfare pet food, you know, making sure that it was organic, that the animals had led relatively good lives. But that's actually very hard to find on pet food. Um, OK, so I started doing a bit of research and I realized that as omnivores, dogs should actually be fine to survive and actually thrive um, without meat in their diets. So I gradually started transitioning yep. him over to a plant based diet. So do they need any supplements in terms of if it's all plant food then you know actually dogs really shouldn't do um okay. i if you're feeding your dog a complete um vegan pet food it should have all of the nutrients they need as part of that pet food and okay. they should be able to come from plant-based sources i actually do feed my dog 
um, Amiga 3 tablets um, oh, okay. just to make sure that he has like an added boost of you know lovely coat shininess and all that stuff yeah. and that but they are also plant-based so they come from plant-based sources same the same yeah. omega-3 that i take um but i would also be doing that if he was eating a meat-based diet so oh really okay. yeah it's just something i already already added in but epa um, and dha specifically exactly mean, exactly like, okay. so yeah i, I was anyway I, I sort of transitioned him onto this plant-based diet and he was doing absolutely fantastically. He was absolutely loving the food, which is obviously a really big deal. I really wanted him to be enjoying the food, and he was. Um, his coat was super shiny, yeah. he has so much energy, and he's he's actually 10 years old. I think you met him just a yeah, minute ago. He's, he's 10, and he <laughs> looks about two or three. I mean, it's amazing. So <laughs> He really does, and we get lots of people sort of saying, "How? what's what's his secret? Yeah, Why does he look so secret? great? And, and when you say a vegan diet, what do they say? They, they get really un uncomfortable, and then they, they run leave. away. <laughs> they just walk away, they're like, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, so yeah, I was, I was so impressed by it how he looked and how well he was doing that I wrote a blog about it um I have a blog that I sort of post things on animal ethics about and where can I wrote, we find that uh that is aliceanimalwelfare.com okay yeah Excellent. so I wrote this blog and it got a bit of interest and attention and then I got a phone call from my old friend Ernie Ward who's a veterinarian in the US yeah um and he just started as chief veterinary officer at a company called Wild Earth and they were creating fungi based dog food. Oh, wow. Yeah. We'll get onto that. Really cool, really cool startup. Um, and wow. okay. him and the CEO there, Ryan Bethencourt, who's also very much involved in the cultured meat sort of area, yep. um, they were really keen to write a book that I guess sort of showed people that there are other ways to feed your pets other than animals yep. um, and sort of spread the word a bit. So, um, yeah, I was like, absolutely, sounds awesome. fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we wrote this book together. Um, and what we, I guess what we really wanted to do with it was to show people that they can take those empathic, sort of compassionate relationships that they have with their dogs and cats yeah. and apply that to so-called food animals. So it's quite hard to do that if you're feeding those cows, pigs, chickens and fish to your dogs and cats. Yeah. Um, I think if you're relying on meat-based pet food to feed your animals, then you're always going to be kind of reinforcing those categories. That's food and that's a friend. Um, yeah. And we wanted to really show that, that, that that doesn't have to be the case, that actually you can kind of break down those barriers and you can get people to really look at the animals in their food as well as the animals that they're feeding. So that's kind of what, where the book idea came from and what we wanted to achieve. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. Um, and how has it been received so far? Really well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was kind of thinking that maybe we'd get some pushback, you know, people saying, how dare you? <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of that with anything that's uh, yeah. changing the status quo at the moment. Yeah. But um, I think as long as you include the science and the book is very evidence based, okay. we, we have a lot of Excellent. references. We try to make it as readable as possible, but yep. also make sure that it's backed up by evidence. Whenever right. we mention something, we made sure there was that science was to essential. back it up. That is essential um, to... And yeah, you, you can't yeah. really argue with, with the science. Well, the science says, <laughs> yeah, they can. And, but so, yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is that um, we're, it seems much more widely accessible that dogs can be uh, vegan. But um, the question is, can cats? And mm. obviously our founder of Hogs and Kisses, uh, Anne, has a cat. And so this is why the subject is so... Uh, yeah means so much to her and a lot of vegans who have cats and uh yeah i was wondering if you could elaborate on them whether we can yeah uh... i think the cats vegan cat owners have it really hard because it's it's kind of there's this really awkward dilemma that we have and, and there's actually an american social psychologist called hank rothgerber who wrote a couple of papers about this and he actually coined this kind of tension that we feel when we're vegans but we feel like we have to feed our animal meat um and he called that the vegetarian's dilemma and i mm. think cat owners feel it so much more because there is this conceived notion that cats cannot eat a plant-based diet it's not yeah. possible um and i think we're forced into kind of as cat owners continuing to feed our cats meat and i guess sort of reinforcing this idea that our cat is more valuable than all these other farmed animals that are being fed to it you know thousands yeah. of animals and if you're feeding your cat fish that's you know millions of animals over the course of its life so yeah. it's really tough and and i think we find various ways to justify it you know 
only feeding byproducts of the human meat industry or um, feeding them highest welfare food we can find or maybe being a pescatarian for instance yeah. are feeding your catfish only but then obviously there are eth ethical issues with that but there's also environmental issues which are so so staggering um i think the average american cat eats 30 pounds of fish a year which actually which is actually more than the average human in industrialized nations really um, yeah wow. it's a staggering amount of fish each year um, and that's obviously having a massive impact on natural resources yeah. and the food for other fish, other seabirds, sea mammals and so on, and also contributing to the corporate exploitation of poor fishermen as well. So it's a human rights issue. Definitely. Yeah, um, sea spiracy. Sea spiracy, that well. exactly. Yeah. I was just going to say that. Yeah. And sea spiracy yeah. obviously focuses very much on human consumption of fish. But I think in America, there's anything, the stats are a bit kind of iffy, but I think there's anything from, I think it's 58 to 94 million cats in America alone, pet cats. So if you imagine all of them eating 30 pounds of fish a year it's, it's wow. just it adds up very yeah quickly. mind blown wow so, so it's, from it's your really research bad. would you say they're obligate carnivores yeah so cats are obligate carnivores and what that means is that they cannot synthesize the nutrients that they need to be healthy and to survive from plant-based sources yeah. and they can't synthesize them inside their bodies so dogs were domesticated many thousands of years ago and they have adapted over the years to um, process the starches in plant-based diets and to synthesize oh, right. the yeah to wow. synthesize the amino acids they need within their body so things like taurine and arginine these essential amino acids that yeah. they need dogs can make them themselves but cats actually have to consume them in preformed state in their food right and these things are not available in preformed state in plant-based diets so they have to get them from animal meats is it possible then to supplement plants with those specific nutrients? A hundred percent. It is yeah. possible. Yeah. So I think this is where we have to make a distinction between domesticated cats and wild cats. So yeah. although biologically, biochemically um, and genetically our cats are the same, whether they're domesticated or wild, um, they need the same nutrients yeah. um, and they need to get them from yeah. somewhere. In the wild, a cat's only source of complete nutrition is another animal. So that might be a mouse or a small bird or even an insect. Um, right. But our, domestic, our domesticated cats can eat commercial diets. And in a commercial diet, those essential vitamins and amino acids can be supplemented from plant-based sources. So they can be um, oh, okay. made synthetically from non-animal right. sources. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's... Um, I've got hello. a little friend come to join us. <laughs> Come on then, that's right. <laughs> Come on then. I haven't thrown it. <laughs> <It's all right>. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's probably he quite can on live brand. Off a vegan diet easily, but <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, cats cats can get um, the nutrients and vitamins that they need from synthetic sources. Right. And actually, what's really interesting is in America. Um, a lot of the commercial meat-based diets for cats don't have enough taurine in them to meet a cat's nutritional needs because once you've kind of processed the kibble or whatever, you've taken out so much of the natural meat content that oh, right. cats actually need taurine to be supplemented. Um, and it's actually, I think, a regulation in America that taurine is added into the food from synthetic sources. Even so, in meat-based yeah, cat, in meat -based cat food. Yeah, in meat-based cat food. So if you're okay. doing that in meat-based cat food, why not? Use just, the plant based yeah. as the base and then supplement into that. Um, and there's lots of vitamins that also cats need, and the same thing it applies to them you know, B yeah. vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin D, some essential fatty acids as well. And all of those things can be yeah. um, supplemented in. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's something that is possible. And if you look for complete vegan plant based cat foods, mm -hmm. they should have all of those things included, and your cat should be able to do absolutely fine on them. Yeah. Okay. The, interesting. The problem is, you know, Will they like them? <laughs> yeah, they can be quite fussy, perhaps, um, as can we humans. So um, mm. uh, I have to take that into account. But um, when it comes to um, non-plant-based cat mm. foods, um, or even dog food as well, or pet food in general, is there such a thing, a difference between brands and quality? And, you know, when they say... I remember I had a, uh, when we had a dog years ago and we bought these biscuits for him, 
I remember reading the ingredients list and it said 11% ash. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. it didn't even say ash of what. So, you know, <laughs> it depends. I'm, I'm, some brands must be better than others, but even still as the... Yeah, I think we're quite lucky here in the UK in that the quality of pet food is fairly high. Um, in America, pet food can be very dodgy. So I think a lot of a lot of what's used is byproducts, which is fine. I think and a lot of human UK... food can be a bit dodgy in America. Exactly. So yeah. If their yeah. food is dodgy, then uh, pet yeah. food is probably worse. Exactly. Well, but... I, th I think it's quite normal to use byproducts for, for pet food, and that's fine as long as, you know, that's probably better environmentally. But at the same mm. time, you have to be really careful about what's going into that. So a lot of pet food is made by a rendering, which means you basically take all the leftover bits of meat that aren't fit for human consumption. It could be all sorts of different animals. You're not really sure what you're getting and you're mushing that all up into this kind of lumpy stew, then dehydrating it and taking out the nutrients, the proteins from right. that and putting them into the pet food. So okay. you're creating this kind of like big mass of meat that you don't really know where it came from. It could be contaminated. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when, when you're talking about feeding animals, the slaughterhouse is always involved and that has risk yep. of contamination. Um, if you Google cat food recalls America, you'll see some frightening statistics oh, about some of the... And just what, lists of things there, that... Yeah, just, just diseases that cats have got oh. from eating meat-based cat food. Oh, really? Salmonella is a huge issue. So there's quite a few research articles about the risks of salmonella and stuff as well. And also this is something that's a risk with feeding your cat raw meat. So that's obviously a very popular thing now, feeding cats raw meat diets. Um, and you're looking at very high risks of um, contamination, not just for the cats, but also for humans when you're, when you're feeding that kind of thing. So yeah, it's, wow. it's, it's pretty, pretty gross. Um, and I, I mentioned before about um, cats liking the food and it being quite difficult to get switch them onto your plant-based diet if they're used to eating meat and one of the reasons for that is that a lot of meat-based food commercially is sprayed with this thing called digest which is basically sort of chicken entrails chicken fat and it's almost like crack for cats like they absolutely <laughs> love it um, and they can get really addicted to it so if you suddenly take that away and you start feeding them you know vegan pet food that is super healthy and lovely but doesn't have this kind of meaty i guess it's like having chicken nuggets here as a human like you get used yeah. to this kind of fast food well that's the thing yeah it's uh all the sort of uh sort of fat sugar and you know yeah texture crispiness th all those things together in things like oreos or whatever mm -hmm. you know we want to get a taste for those things we don't really want chickpeas you know and things that yeah. vegetables that you know <clears throat> uh, we change our sort of uh, taste profile yeah and uh I don't know if um, you know we can if we stay off those foods for a while, then our taste buds change. I don't know if cats would experience the same. I think probably yeah. I think it's a case of sort of weaning them off of it. Um, and I think if you're going to do that with a cat or dog, if you're switching a cat onto um, a different diet, you really need to do it gradually. You can't just yeah. sort of switch it out. Also, I think that would be quite dangerous because their bodies have got used to eating a certain yeah. thing, and you have to really sort of transition them. So could you I would, mix? and yeah, change the ratio exactly. up the ratio until you and hopefully they'll acquire the taste as it, yeah precisely as it that. Goes along. you can also sprinkle yeah. a bit of nutritional yeast because cats really like nutritional yeast and it's they? great for them yeah really so that that can it's sort of cheesy and they can like get the nooch them as well mm, no yeah. way okay well you heard it here first yeah, cats are more vegan than we thought <laughs> yeah they love nutritional yeast and yeah. they're cheesy macaroni cheese make them some macaroni totally cheese. yeah <laughs> um yeah so uh, veganism obviously has been growing almost exponentially of, of late mm. amongst, um, you know, uh, us human folk because of, uh, you know, many reasons, health, you know, the environment and ethical reasons as well. Yeah. But um, so these may also be reasons for, um, you know, getting animals onto uh, our pets onto plant based diets as well. But you've, um, I believe, looked into various different forms of uh, uh, sort of yeah, creating um, pet food, not just from regular plants and vegetables, but uh, one being insect protein, mm -hmm. uh, fungal uh, protein or algae based. Um, and I was wondering if we could, well, first of all, start with insect protein, because that's uh, yeah. an interesting topic. Even f from a human point of view, people talk about that totally. as being a... I mean, I'd rather just eat plants than insects, but yeah, what, from a cat food point of view? Yeah, I mean, the, uh... insects, I think insect-based pet food has actually been sort of around as a concept a bit longer than vegan pet food. Um, 
certainly environmentally it's a winner um i think pound for pound also in terms of health wise pound for pound um insects so talking about crickets let's use crickets as an example as they are obviously used a lot in insect based sure. food yeah um so crickets have twice the amount of protein as beef um, really also a gram of a kilogram of crickets creates one gram of greenhouse gas a kilogram of beef creates 2850 grams of greenhouse gas so environmentally it's just a no-brainer you also when you're farming insects you're using obviously far less land far less water feed yeah. energy all that stuff so it's much less resource intensive um and there's no reason why your cat should not be able to do fantastically well on an insect based diet because insects have the exact the right nutritional profile for cats so uh, okay. some research showed i think that four out of five of the most commonly used species in insect based pet food actually exceed the national research council's requirements for um, nutrition for cats so amino acids wow. and proteins um, so actually your cat should do really well and unsurprisingly because cats would eat insects in the wild so it's a, it's actually their natural diet really yeah i didn't, didn't yeah. know that actually yeah they, it's something that they would eat dogs too so um yeah it's a great diet in that respect so I, they definitely like them they like That's them so. yeah well <laughs> so. probably more so than humans i think this is why it's probably a better option for pets than humans because it's certainly in the Western world, we can be very squeamish about well, eating insects. Well, they don't look that appealing, do they? It doesn't look that appetising, <laughs> at least from my point of view. Yeah, I, mean, I, have, I haven't eaten a scorpion on the you know street food counter in Thailand, but um, I probably won't at any point, <laughs> no. to be honest. But, it doesn't uh, look that great, does it? But um, yeah, I think our cats would probably love them. Why not? But I, I think ethically, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, yeah, because I know their, their level of sentience is a lot lower. At least we, we assume that. I think so... it's hard to know. I mean, I, person <laughs> I personally um, think that, I mean, I, I probably would want to err on the side of caution. I think insects at least have some level of sentience. I'm sure that they can feel pain um, and it maybe think, experience yeah. that in a, in a way that is relative to vertebrate animals. Um, I think it's a essential part of any animal's evolution to be able to feel pain, yeah. to be able to survive. Mm -hmm. right, ultimately yeah so i don't see why they wouldn't be able to feel it in some way exactly and i think that there's also quite a lot of evidence that shows that they do um i think the question is whether they experience pain in the same way that a vertebrate animal and and a human uh, you know might i think we just can't know um and because of that i think we really need to you know be careful about how we treat insects i think the reason why i would advocate insect farming over vertebrate farming maybe even as a transition if you're worried about switching your pet immediately onto a plant-based diet insects might be a good way to kind of ease into that yeah. and the reason why i think it's slightly better i don't think it's ideal but i think it's slightly better is that insects already live very short lives they're not when they're killed in farming it's done um, normally quite near the end of their natural lifespan unlike with vertebrate animals where they you know killed at a fraction of their natural lifespan yeah um also, they are used to living in very cramped conditions, so intensive farming for insects is actually kind of normal for them. Um, and the way that they're killed is they te the temperature tends to be lowered and they're put into they a sort of slow down. like coma almost. Yeah. Okay. So, it, you know, it's, it's not nice, but it's not the way that animals are slaughtered, like chickens and cows and pigs. Yeah. So in that sense, it's certainly... There's a bit of an ethical dilemma with this, even though environmentally it can be a lot better. Yeah, I um, think it's, you know, it's, it's, a gray, it's a gray area. I think yeah. in, eating insects is not a straightforward black and white. It is ethical or isn't. I think it's, sure. it's a tricky one. Um, and that's why I would always say I think plant-based is probably better. But Yeah, so obviously with insect-based, uh, we have to be, yeah, concerned about the possible ethical implications of that, even though it's more of a gray area. But obviously that's not the case with fungal and uh, algae base, but obviously they're, well, they're not technically a plant. At least the fungus isn't technically mm. a plant, is it? Mm. The algae is. Yeah, I, so I think you define algae as, I might be low. wrong on this, but I think you define it as plant-based, but yeah. yeah. So would that, con that wouldn't contain everything a cat? No, so um, for example, you've got 
because animals are a company in Philadelphia who are creating algae-based algae products, um, but they're supplements. So they have something called a super superfood supplement for cats and dogs. Okay. Um, but the idea isn't that the cat would solely eat that. You would add it to their right. um, vegan or meat-based cat food, whatever you're feeding them, their complete okay. but diet. You would then supplement with this algae-based food, okay. which is really good for your cats. You know, it's fantastic at building up healthy gut bacteria and increasing their natural immunity. But they wouldn't be able to survive on it because it wouldn't contain sure. all those nutrients and amino acids that they need. Is it like spirulina for them or something? Yeah, okay. it looks like that. So oh, oh, yeah, right. okay. so I used to yeah. feed it to my dog actually. Um, I oh, got yeah? some samples from ages ago and. Um, you actually sort of can, you can put it in your own smoothies as well. So you can put some of it on your dog's food or your cat's food, and then you can add <laughs> right. some of it to your, your own okay. smoothie. <laughs> yeah, so it's super healthy. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, but also fungi-based food is a really interesting one because uh, Wild Earth, who Ernie, my co-author, was working for at the time of writing, um, they were, or they are still, creating this amazing koji-based dog food, right. which is a complete food for dogs but it wouldn't be complete for cats for the reasons okay. that you say, you know, it doesn't yeah. contain all those um, amino acids that they need, but again, super healthy for them. So if you wanted to add a bit into their other diet, then great. I think it, it's really good. And also cats and dogs really love it. It's very oh, high yeah. protein, very sort of tasty food. So I've heard anecdotally that cats really like it, even though it's not really meant for them. So yeah, really <laughs> might be worth just like trying a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. So obviously, um, we have the um, ethical issue with uh, feeding cats meat, but um, would it be perhaps better to allow them to maybe hunt and feed them vegan food at home and so that they may get everything they need, but allow them to hunt, which is part yeah. of their instinct, but obviously then means birds, small birds or yeah, mice it's, get killed. It's a really interesting question because I think cats will hunt regardless of what you're feeding them. If you have outdoor cats, I think... Yeah, okay. I mean, if a cat's being fed a complete nutritional diet, so if they're having a complete pet food, whether it be vegan or otherwise, they shouldn't be needing to go out and hunt, you know, dog, yeah. hunt dogs, hunt mice, and um, <laughs> they certainly wow. shouldn't be doing that. Why? Hunt if mice you've got and a birds. tiger, they might be hunting dogs. But, <laughs> um, yeah. but I think you'll probably find, and um, I certainly had this experience when I was growing up with cats, that they will still go out and hunt. As you say, it's their natural instinct. And they probably won't be actually eating the food. They'll be depositing it at your feet as like a nice friendly gift on your kitchen floor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I think you could do that, but I, I don't think, I think it's a whole separate ethical dilemma. I don't necessarily think that their diet comes into it. I think it's just a, a natural instinct that they have and it's more of a behavioural thing. And I think it would be a really interesting topic for another discussion. Yeah. Should you have outdoor or indoor cats? You know, what are the ethical implications of keeping your cats indoors versus outdoors? And what yeah. does that mean for small animals? I think yeah. that's a really interesting discussion. But I don't think that what you're feeding your cat necessarily has a bearing on that. So, right. okay. so yeah. yeah. Okay, I got you. Um, so obviously being at the forefront of uh, vegan pet food, um, would you say that there's a bit of a pet food revolution going on at the moment like <laughs> yeah. are things changing because I at the moment don't have a um, pet myself it's been a while since uh, we had a dog and so I've not I'm completely out of touch with the world of uh, pet food so um, and other people yeah. might be too if they've just been buying the same thing the whole sure. time and they're not really yeah. sure so what um, you know what's changing and what is available think, and yeah, what do you I, see coming in the future? Such exciting things on the horizon. Um, I think pet food is getting a lot of attention at the moment. I think the plant-based side, which we've discussed certainly is, there's been more research coming out recently about the health of plant-based diets for cats as well as dogs. A paper by Sarah Dodd um, came out, I think a couple of months ago now, which was all about whether plant-based cats can, um, how well they're doing, whether they're healthy or not. And actually it was really positive. So that's really exciting. Um, but also there's this whole other world of 
cultivated meat or lab grown meat, which yeah. is kind of what I think you probably know it as. And I think um, yeah. the producers of lab grown meat are really sort of shying away from using the term lab grown because it conjures up these images of like scientists and artificial awfulness. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, certainly for human consumption. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I didn't know they were thinking about it from a pet food point Absolutely. of view. Absolutely. And I think what's so I guess just to explain a little bit about what cultivated meat is. Basically, you take a small biopsy of cells from an animal, yeah. um, whether that be a chicken or a cow or even yeah. a mouse, um, yeah. and you do that without harming the animal, with, certainly without killing it. It shouldn't even hurt. It's a yeah. small biopsy. Um, yeah. And you then use those cells to grow meat outside of the animal. Yeah. So you feed it with a sort of nutrients and vitamins that you would feed an animal with, yeah. but you're just feeding those cells outside of the body. Yeah. And what you end up with is a product that is meat, but no animal has been harmed. Um, it can be much healthier because you're not, there's no involvement of any slaughterhouse. There's no kind of contamination. Um, no adrenaline and all exactly, that. Exactly, none the, of that stuff. Yeah. No antibiotics, yeah. no, um, no kind of nasties really. And you can also add things to it that make it even healthier. So yeah. you can make it low in saturated fat and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it has exactly the same amino acid profile, the same nutritional profile as real meat, because it is real meat. It's just grown outside the animal. So that opens up all sorts of possibilities, certainly for cats. So for anyone yeah. who is worried about feeding a plant-based diet for cats, or maybe their cat just really doesn't like it, having an actual meat-based diet to feed them where no animal has been harmed is just an incredible win. And what's really exciting about it for pets as well is that it could come to the market sooner because while humans want to eat meat that looks like meat, they want to eat a steak or a chicken wing, that actually isn't possible with the current science that we've got. They can only sort of create a sort of cultivated meat that is like mince meat. Yeah, I was wondering how that yeah. would work. Yeah. And for cats and dogs, that's kind of what their pet food looks like anyway. So they're not going to be like, I'm not going to eat this. It doesn't look like a steak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, exactly. Yeah, yeah where's so it's my actually really exciting. Yeah, um, and a, I should, a company called Because Animals are one of the people making this, and they're the one who do the, the supplements for cats. They're working on cultured mouse meat for cats, which is very cool because it's obviously species appropriate diet you know feeding your cat chicken and cow isn't really kind of normal you know why when would they ever eat chickens and cows in the wild so feeding them exactly. yeah. a cell-based mouse diet actually makes a lot more sense okay. um, so that's really exciting and they actually hope to have products on the market in the next couple of years um, there's also a company called bond pet foods who are creating uh, chicken for pets so for dogs and cats and they're using chicken cells to do that. And, okay. and they're quite far along the line yeah. as well. They said, I think in two, two or three years time, they'll be releasing that onto mm -hmm. the market. Yeah. So this is, that's two, two startups that are already doing it. And I think we'll see more and more. And that's why I think, yes, I do think that a pet food revolution is coming. And I think that we're gonna have so many more options in the future. Yeah. So and now, yeah, great. we see there's so many options uh, for us. Yeah. As uh, you know, Tesco's, all the supermarkets are just full Mm. of plant-based options it's all growing and it, i suppose it's just slightly behind you know yeah. in uh, yeah. uh, those products because and, yeah. as the demand goes up then and also the way that we see our pets is changing i think we're seeing our pets more and more like they're part of the family um, because oh, yeah. they are you know oh, for and, sure. and yeah. um and we want to give our pets the same choices that we have so the fact that these companies are using science to you know they're disrupting and they're real rebuilding this kind of broken mm. food system we have um, yeah. And they're doing it to benefit pets, but also to benefit yeah. the planet and yeah. to um, benefit farm animals as well, yeah. which is yeah, really absolutely. nice. You know, it's, it's just great that actually we're looking at a world where maybe we don't have to farm animals for food anymore. Which so. would be wonderful. But it's yeah. interesting, you, yeah, um, you say giving the, uh, our pets the choice. We're not really, do we, we don't really give them the, the yeah. choice as much, yeah, do we? We, we we'll make a choice for on them. their behalf <laughs> with the yeah, best intentions. Yeah, I think this um, is it. I think our pets live in a very restricted human world and everything they do, we, we have a responsibility, I strongly feel, to try to give them as many choices as possible. Um, and yes, we're ultimately always going to be making the decision for them. But if we can you know, try out several different brands with our pets, several different kinds of food and see which ones they like best, yeah. then at least we're saying, you know, they've had some kind of small input into what they're eating. Yeah. Um, 
I guess and they'll uh, let you know if they don't eat yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and our ultimate like responsibility it. is to make sure that they're as healthy and happy as possible. That so. is fundamental, really. Um, yeah. You, I think you were saying there's a lot of um, obese, clinically obese yeah. pets out yeah. there. And yeah. it's, you know, if, if, if you want to do the best by your pets, you want to have them live their longest, healthiest life possible. Um, you know, same for us, you know, your kids or, you know, mm -hmm anyone you know yourself you want to you want to live a happy healthy sort of disease free life and uh, the pets are you know no different surely yeah yeah um, yeah exactly we want them to live as long as they possibly can and as well as they possibly can and that means giving them a great diet that keeps them yeah. slim active healthy yeah, energetic yeah. you know living their best life so exactly. i'm hoping that all these different pet food options mean that in the future then that will be easier and easier for owners and we'll be able to yeah. just give them the best life possible. <laughs> Indeed. Is there anything that you would like to add? Like anything you would like to uh, make people aware of? Um... Um, no, I mean, I think generally there's, I, I'm, I'll share some links with you that maybe we can, you can share as part of the video, like internet links yeah, and stuff well, to some of the sites that sort of have some of the research summarised. Um, my old professor um, from my MSc, Andrew Knight, um, he has a website which is packed with information all about the science behind feeding um, vegan pet food, yeah. whether cats or dogs. Um, and then there's also a number of research papers that I mentioned, so I can send some links to those. But mm -hmm. yeah, there's just a ton of evidence, a ton of stuff on the internet that's kind of, you know, supporting these ideas and just anecdotes yeah. as well from owners who've had great experiences transitioning their yeah. pets onto meat-free diets. Excellent. Well, Alice, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Like, you we too. really appreciate um, you taking the time uh, for us because uh, uh, obviously with uh, our Beat About the Barn series, we're trying to get, you know, um, or discuss um, interesting topics and give you know people plenty of information to transfer well transition themselves to a vegan diet but also you know the pets that they uh, yeah. love so uh, yeah from on behalf of uh, Anne and Ella as well thank you so much for, thank for you. being here and thank talking to us thank you so much us. for having me and I'm really interested to hear the like discussion that goes on afterwards yeah there's going to be some more so yeah thank you thank you Wow, what an amazing interview. And I am here joined with Ella and we have Belle as well. Belle is a uh, very near and dear uh, volunteer for us at um, Hogs and Kisses. Why don't you just say really quickly, Belle, um, a bit about maybe how you went vegan and kind of your backstory a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I first went vegetarian actually when I was about 12. Um, I saw Meet Your Meat from PETA oh, um, yeah. and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I did not know that was happening in slaughterhouses. Um, uh -huh. And from then, you know, throughout middle school and high school, I learned more about more about the industry. I, I really defined my principles more. And once I got to college, I realized that, you know, like only being vegan and only mm -hmm. completely removing uh, or trying to remove um, the use of animals from my life was, was in line with my principles and that's when I really went vegan. Um, and from then it's just grown into a lot more, you know, intersectional social justice work and I find my veganism to be like a, a, a big impetus for all that work mm -hmm. that I've done. Yeah. And do you have a cat? Are you a guardian to a cat? I am. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is why we absolutely had to have Belle here too. As you all know, I have a cat. Ella does not, but... I grew up with cats yes. and I don't have a cat on purpose. So, <laughs> that's yes, so this is a very good too. dynamic mm -hmm. for this round table discussion. <laughs> um, so where do we begin? Because there are so many pieces to this, right? Ultimately, as you all know, the episode is should vegans be guardians to cats, but there's so many things that go around this. Um, do we want to first look at being guardian to a cat or do we want to look at the type of animal meat or not, whether it be um, more environmentally based and friendly? Where should we start with all of this? What do you think, Ella? I don't know, and you uh, mm -hmm. you introed this whole thing, mm -hmm. you know, talking about your beloved. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, do you want to tell us a little bit more about mm. your choices? Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, um, 
I, uh, so I've see, I've had the cats now for about six years. Um, Santiago, he's the tabby colored one. Um, I literally saw him get hit by a car and I went out in the street and rescued him. It was like, not on my watch is this cat going down, you know? And um, I just, um, you know, every everything he needed, he needed a lot of medical attention and different things. So because of that, actually, his food does have to be a little bit different. Um, he has to be on meds every day. He has to take this stuff um, that helps him be able to go to the bathroom. Um, so I automatically was looking more from that medical standpoint at first, but already in my head, culturally, I was absolutely like, well, of course, yeah, you just feed your cat meat. You know what I mean? Like I thought that's what they, you know, do. So anyway, um, now as time goes on, you're opening these little canisters. Cause I do a little bit of dry and I do cans, right. Of, of meat. And you know me, like when I do things, I try and do things like I am known as extra, right. And everyway. So I looked for the best possible brands. I look for, you know, as her, pet, as her pet sitter, I can attest. <laughs> yes. I always am out there looking for stuff. And on top of that are my cats are also finicky, right. As well. So I've gone through multiple different kinds. Um, um, but, um, I will not and refuse to buy the, you know, the brands that are 99 cents and I'm sorry, but you know, fancy feast, no way. Like I won't even buy, um, what is the stuff? Science Hill or Hill oh, diet, science diet science stuff. Science yeah. Diet. Uh -huh. Nah. Uh -uh. This is like Burger King. For it cats. is. It's all like that. And so then I, I actually started to research on. Uh, there are these so-called third-party animal food researchers for both dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. Now, I just question how third-party they are, but they do a pretty good analysis. And then I also saw some of them get shut down after about two or three years. Their websites are down and they're no longer, and now other companies are up. Mm. So from ones that I have seen, I definitely look out for, you know, fish that's pulled out of Thailand, of course. As you know, maybe those of you who are vegan have seen Seaspiracy, right? You know, and you know what's going on in terms of our oceans as well. So it's like, I mean, I am constantly faced with like, oh God. And I have tried vegan food. Don't you get me wrong. I have absolutely mm -hmm. tried that and given it to them and they will not touch it. I've gone to even um, you know, uh, at the counter <laughs> at the grocery store and, you know, in Whole Foods, they have, um, a rating system mm -hmm. on how the animals were raised and all this kind of stuff. So you can go and get like a one, two, three, or five animal mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like this. And I even went and got some chicken that was supposedly animal grade, top of line, the best possible human raised, you know, humane raised. And they even then get tired. Like they, they don't stick to the same thing. So it's really tough dilemma for me to A, have them fed, get them what they need in their nutrients, have them like it, you know, um, so that I'm not just buying things and now wasting that poor animal, right, you know? And then on top of that, now I have to face the fact that I'm sitting there opening, right, a fish or a, or a you know, chicken, um, because I just don't buy, right, pig or cow meat, because I just, I guess in my head, think that cats in the wild would never kill a pig or a cow. But <laughs> the other flip side of that standpoint, right, is that it's so readily killed anyway that it's, you know, it's byproduct anyway, right? But from a, hopefully a supply demand position, I'm saying no on that, right? Um, it's, it's so, I have all of those thoughts go through my head every time I go and try and buy something. Mm -hmm. So I am literally still in that place where I'm like, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this is, um, I'm gonna let Belle cause you have a lot more to say than I do, but uh, this is why I don't, I don't have a cat mm -hmm. is because I, I refuse to give money purchase meat mm -hmm. um, not just about the opening the can of mm -hmm. the meat it's about what I'm giving money to and what I'm supporting in and there is just no humane treatment mm -hmm. of animals mm -hmm. I, when they're killed that's not humane mm -hmm. it's just inevitably not humane so I don't want to have to make that decision mm -hmm. um, so hands off to you for even putting yourself in that position mm. um, so I'm gonna stick with the dog who has <laughs> no problem uh, with being an, uh, with being a, a vegan she's mm -hmm. she thrives on a vegan diet she's 15 she's you saw her she's running around yes yes uh, she's amazing anyway um, so that's that's where I'm at there I know that there's no easy answer mm -hmm. I want to get into the science part of mm -hmm. what's possible because yes. that's kind of where my head's at and yes. speeding up 
that possibility. So we'll yes. get there, but Belle, do you yeah. want to talk about what you yeah. do? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I I also, I have two cats, um, mm -hmm. and they're, they're 18 years old. I got them when they were 16, wow. so I, I also actually think of it from a medical standpoint. Well, at first when I got them, I was mm -hmm. a student, so I, d I bought like Friskies, you uh -huh. know, like I, uh -huh. I mean, that's just what, yeah. Um, but then they are 18, so they both of course have, you know, some kidney problems, right. so they are on the mm. insanely expensive KD mm -hmm. prescription mm -hmm. kidney mm -hmm. diet. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, you know, I, I, I think, um, I think that, yeah, just medically necessary, that's what it is. And, and it, within my own veganism and, and, and what I think of it, you know, I do think least harm, it should be a least harm principle and and when medically necessary i think you know even even humans personally um you know if veganism isn't accessible mm -hmm. from a medical standpoint for humans from cats you know like i think you know then i guess uh, anyway okay yeah. <laughs> but, um, so that's where i am for them but i also i've rescued fish i have um mm. a bunch of rescue guppies and some goldfish mm -hmm. um and in the past i've rescued um a snake i've rescued a bearded dragon and they obviously are also um right, right like they also will always eat animals they mm -hmm. eat they eat animals uh, and partially from the um, biological what their body needs standpoint and also from the from what's natural for them to mm -hmm. hunt you know like mm -hmm. like my beard dragon got so excited when i would put the critic crickets in her cage really? like it was just like so she, was, she loved it like, uh-huh i mean yeah um so I, I've, I've also thought about this for a really, really long time. And it, it's mm -hmm. also led me in my thinking, um, especially before I really knew about um, what was possible with lab grown meat and you know, what we'll talk about in a bit. Sure, yeah. But I've always thought um, is personally, I, I come from an abolitionist standpoint in my veganism. And my goal, though I know it is maybe not, it's not palatable. It's not really what I even, it, it, it pains me to even think of it, but that um, one day I, I, I think that the end of domesticated animals, the end of their species is really the only way to ensure no harm to animals. Um, both from, from the domesticated animals, the pet standpoint, mm -hmm. um, they are completely dependent on us, uh -huh. you know? Um, right. They, they rely on us for everything. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, you could get into all sorts of things. You could get into mm -hmm. dogs, you know, like German Shepherds who have hip dysplasia. You could get into all those mm -hmm. things that domesticating animals has harmed them, mm. but also they are dependent on the pet industrial complex is is linked with the animal industrial complex with uh -huh. the food that they eat um you know so i i mean i personally am for that end for for mm -hmm. i mean a gradual a very yep. peaceful mm -hmm. right like sanctuaries like this and like mm -hmm. other sanctuaries that provide homes as we eventually you know um work mm -hmm. towards their 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 extinction i guess if sure you will. Yeah. yeah i guess that's yeah. kind of what we're doing with uh with the adoptions and yes. the pounds, right? right. I mean, exactly. I guess I, if you have pets mm -hmm. uh, that you rescued and you're caring mm -hmm. for now for yep. the rest of their natural life, you're kind of a micro sanctuary. Absolutely, right? yeah. yes. Absolutely. Yes. Really yeah. interesting, a, a way to yeah. think about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, right, it always comes down to then, you know, you are the one as the guardian, you're the caregiver, you are the one responsible now, mm -hmm. right? So if that's the case, making the choices for the best possible life for that right. animal, right? And so with, and this is where I think that we can now kind of diverge with cats and with dogs because still plenty of people believe like, oh my gosh, dogs have to eat meat, but actually they're omnivores so they can thrive and get all the possible nutrients that they need uh, on a plant-based diet. Cats are obligate carnivores, right? So meaning there are certain, um, uh, I think plant matter and such that they cannot actually process and th synthesize in their bodies, in their stomach. And so they get certain amino acids that they need from meat only, right? So how we have learned now about this though, is that even though, uh, as you all saw Alice talking about companies who so-called have meat in those cans, canned food or dry food, they're still adding in the amino acids in there because whatever they've thrown in there, the byproduct of that animal or the meal or whatever is not really actual, right? Like fresh meat kind of thing. So it's, it's begging the question for us to really know what we're feeding them. Um, like I will definitely will not buy uh, anything unless the first ingredient has, it's the full meat. If it doesn't say that it's chicken or if it doesn't say that it's fish is first, I literally put it down, you know? 
Not that that's even any better, but it's slightly a little better than say the mealy stuff, right? You know, <laughs> because hopefully they're getting something more out of it. Anyhow, so that is really the question. So if they're all the good carnivores, but yet now all of this canned food kind of might already be more mealy and plant-based and just additives are added in there, are your cats really eating meat, right? Is, is a, an amazing thing there. And for me, when I was reading this book, it jumped off the page to me. I was like, oh man, are they actually kind of uh, pointing towards that domesticated cats should be their own classification? Because there are some cats that, there are vegans out there that absolutely um, have um, uh, vegan cat food and feed them that, and maybe they'll even add some taurine. Taurine's like the, the big um, 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 uh, mineral or ingredient. Is it amino acid, amino I think? Acid. Sorry, amino acid that um, is added, right, to the food. And some cats will thrive that way. Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> there are some cats, and I've spoken to some sanctuaries even, who um, have some cats who are guardians to cats, and went that route. They were gung-ho, we're gonna try this. Oh great, they even liked the food, added the taurine, they loved it. And those particular cats, not all of them, but maybe some of them started to develop some, some issues, medical issues. And so they had to then re-engage and put in some chicken or some fish back into their, into their diets. So it was like almost now an individualistic thing as well, right? So it was um, really uh, an interesting concept, you know, as, as reading, yeah. you know, that through. Yeah, well, that's where I just want to speed up the rate at which uh -huh. this lab-grown meat mm. is is uh, the technology she was saying, I think three years out. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. Yeah. in this day and age, right. we can have it sooner. If they can yeah. develop a vaccine in yeah. a matter of months, yeah. they can develop this sooner. If they have yeah. the funding, I think they yes. think yeah. they're lacking the funding. And the social yes. pressure. And the social pressure. Yes. And well, so, and not only that, another third piece to that, because I actually, you know, one of the co-authors was Dr. Ernie Ward, mm -hmm. and I had listened to some stuff of his, like on YouTube of his interviews. He was actually saying too, on the, on the the, the, what is it, the rules and regulations and the policy to pass something through is safe. Mm -hmm. You, you, you know, so yes, funding was definitely a big one. Um, and then also, yes, the social pressures of it. And then thirdly was, gosh, now to try and get something passed through, right. you know, so, so then going through all of those pieces now, does that have to be animal tested mm -hmm. in order for it mm -hmm. to be okay or mm -hmm. not? Right? right. It brings up a whole slew of things. So three years to me was actually, I was like, wow, she thinks that fast in my head. I was oh. thinking fast. I know oh. <laughs> it was. You, what right. were you thinking? Uh, yeah. Mm. I'm not sure actually. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I don't know. I mean, it, I can see how it feels both like mm -hmm. for, as a you know as someone who thinks about these issues. I'm like, oh my god, can it please happen tomorrow? Right. Like, yes. I'm done with this. Exactly. But also, like, it does sound pretty fast. I mean, when you yeah. think about all that, and plus, I was also thinking animal ag is, is going to push against it, right? Well, like, I mean, there's, that's, you I know, mean, they're up against yes, they are. Right. major, and all major, the pet food right. companies, and the lobbyists, and, and, right. yeah, but wow, you know, I, I was really thinking, like, I yeah, was really thinking time. that, um, you know, I obviously don't eat, don't eat animals, but, like, I would much rather eat something that I know was grown safely mm. in, I mean, in a lab, but like she said, it's, it's, you don't think, it's not really a lab. Like it's, I would rather it be somewhere that's safe. There's, there's no need for, you know, there's no animal who poops and pees uh -huh. and bleeds Horns and, you know, and, right, all these yeah. things. Right. Like I would yeah. personally rather eat that. Like I think mm -hmm. that sounds much more appetizing for myself, but also for animals. So I feel like I can see how social pressure might, uh -huh. might build and build. really, you know, really help with that. Well, yeah. So it's actually, I think social pressure pressure then going to influence the dollars, right? Because if mm. these companies know yes, the social exactly. right, that they'll right. buy it. If right. they just want right. to know the demand is there right. exactly. to then create exactly. the supply, right? Yeah, yeah. So there is that company she mentioned, it was called Because Animals. Uh -huh. I've now, um, I think I've now signed up for a lot of their newsletters just to keep up to date because I'm like, the minute they come out with something, you bet yes. I will buy the food. <laughs> and there's no question. Yes. For me, at least. Like, exactly. Once that comes out, yes. no excuse, right. in my opinion. Absolutely. I think that will be a nice, nice option, right? Technology Right. really is a big factor here yeah. I think yeah. um, you know I know that they've brought up some which I did I mean it made me pause it really did some of the other really great um, angles um, where they were talking about the insect based foods mm -hmm. because right. whether insects or not actually are like sentient beings mm -hmm. or not yeah. right is a question so for an ethical vegan it's really hard you don't want to switch 
Peter for Paul. Yeah. Right? You know, you know, you know, you want to value all life, right? All energy of life. However, definitely from an environmental standpoint, of course, their lifespan is much longer. That's, growing yeah. them, the space to grow them. You don't need fields of them. The contamination to our water system. You know, what I mean, like everything you can imagine, right? In, in terms of that environmentally, that was like, oh wow, holy moly! I had never thought of something like that. And cats, I mean, they love. Love, Insects. love. I mean, my Sophia. Obvious. Yes. Right. Oh my God. I so I whenever there's a fly <laughs> in our house, I talk to the fly and I say, "Fly, get out of here." <laughs> Sophia is coming for you, and she will eat you. I oh, mean, yeah. my Sophia is like the biggest huntress. She will. And I got her at what six weeks old. I didn't teach her that. That was innate. She knew right, right. how to hunt, and she's effective. So. However, it was interesting <laughs> that half the time they don't even eat it, though. Right. They have yes. the instinct still to to, to, to get, get it, it so, but not then because. Mm -hmm. That on that front is they're getting the food from us. Right. So for them, it's play. Right. Right. So a lot of times I'll actually see her smush it and then mm -hmm. she'll push it. Like, right. get up yeah, again. Right. Like, go yeah. so I can chase you yeah. again, you yeah. know? Yeah. 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 Oh, interesting. Yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah, it is really interesting. And they and they do that with mice too. Like, mm -hmm. if, if they're getting mm -hmm. fully fed their, and their needs, needs are met, yeah, they'll do that with all kinds of different yeah. <laughs> lizards and yeah. Oh, yeah. So, anywho, so that was one of them, right, was the insect. The other one was, like, the fungal and the algae-based, which mm -hmm. was interesting, right? Right. Yeah, I, I much, much preferred uh -huh. that and mm -hmm. and um, and the cell-based meat. Yeah. Right, like you were saying, like, Peter for Paul, like, why, right. why build up an industry right. yes. that you... Yes. that. Mm -hmm. that you plan to deconstruct like why right. not just maybe go for what you really want go yeah, for yeah. your ideal world go yeah. for your ideal system yeah, yeah right. i really liked that a lot. yeah i was interested in that yeah. it was yeah it was so it was just really really cool all of the you know options they brought up because i was definitely like no you know animals are carnivores are obligate carnivores and they just you don't need to be and now by really looking at it you know and again as a vegan and i even consider myself as an ethical vegan right you know so so, and I look at it and go, mm, gosh, wow, huh, jeez, mm. what about that? What about this? You know, um, so I'm really thankful that they've written this book yes. to um, put these options, you know, out there. Right. Are they, are they obligate carnivores or right. are they obligate taurine eaters? Exactly. <laughs> Whatever. Exactly. Like, I mean, yeah, That's right. right. That's the question. Yeah. Because yeah. once you actually look at what is food and you start mm -hmm. to unpack all the mm -hmm. things about what is food, mm -hmm. then you're like, ah, it's an energy of this calorie mm -hmm. or if it, you know, so yeah, if it's this, that they're taurine eaters, we'll shoot, you know, can we cultivate some really high quality taurine, right? To yeah. continue to add stuff for, for them or what have you. Yeah. Um, and then I think there was the option that, uh, that some vegans will feed vegans vegan food, right? Vegan cat food, put a little taurine in there, right? And then open the door for your cat to go outside so they have the freedom to exercise their hunting instincts to then go out and hunt for themselves. And maybe they kill and eat it and they get some of that extra added piece um, there. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, that's just, <laughs> it's already like, right? just so, the, yeah. letting cats go outside is, or just decimates wild bird populations. Correct. Like, yeah. and then like they're saying like, they exactly. don't even eat it half the time. Exactly. Um, so right. I, I mean, I just think that, yeah, that yeah. is not like, so it's not really like a, a solution, solution. No, right? No, yeah. It's, not, it's a not really a solution. Now, if you're looking at it from like, okay, enrichment of their life, letting them out. Okay. Right. But it's not a solution to what we're talking about right. here today. I mean, built, so. I have a catio for that purpose yes, and I, right. I have a harness exactly. for my cat blue and we walk we take walks around oh, i yard. love that yeah and like you know he'll run after they mm -hmm. yeah, love it. Yeah. You know, I got this one harness anyway, and they wiggled out of it. And I should have gotten a better one because I think Sophia would have loved yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, Santiago maybe not so much, but yeah. yeah. But anyhow, yeah. So I think that idea of like, oh well, let them hunt is not really a solution because, as Belle said, they're going to end up killing. And again, as a vegan, you want all life to be honored and happy and healthy. Mm -hmm. And actually, I believe there's even there's even now I uh, heard some environmentalists talking saying that. Um, certain bird populations right. have been now, like you said, decimate, right? And they're really thinking that feral cats and just cats in general being outside yeah. have really been a huge catalyst to that. Right, so, right. yeah, so we want to right, create harmony, you know, is what we really want to do. And we have to just, you know, distinguish between domestic yes, and right. cat cats in the wild. Yeah. Uh, big cats. Big right, time. You know? Yes. Agreed. Because that's a whole different... That's a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. It is. It is. Right. Yeah. So then is that what we're saying? I mean, 
I guess just technology is our solution then? Is that what it is? I yeah. think so. Yeah. I mm. mean, yeah, I mean, I think it'll be a long process. Like, mm -hmm. I think even beyond just three three mm -hmm. years or whatever, because then making oh, it accessible to everyone. That. I know. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, making it um, so that yeah. the, the folks who, who are purchasing mm -hmm. the 99 cent cat food, like, right. when will they be able to do this? Exactly. When will the low-income vegans yeah. be For able to sure. afford this? Right. That's um, exactly right. Um, and until yeah. then, you know, you know, Keeping, keeping, keeping in mind that everyone is is doing their best to do the least yeah. harm, and, and, yes. and right, um, making sure that we're all working towards like a like together towards like yes. a compassionate yes. life for yes. all animals. Yeah. Exactly, and beat around the barn. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So we'd really love to know what you all think. Um, we, of course, are going to put all of the notes in the bottom of our of our show, um, the episode of the show. And we'd love for you to leave some comments. You know, are, are you um, pro feeding meat to your cats because they are obligate carnivores? Do you now see your cat more as domesticated cats such that we have now shifted, right, their, their biology and maybe now you feed them fully vegan. Um, and maybe you're a vegan and your cat loves vegan cat food, which mm -hmm. is amazing yeah. if they do. <laughs> um, so we'd like to hear all of that and, and, and maybe some of you have some other angles that you've been researching as well. Um, I'll also include uh, some of the research links that Alice had mentioned about Dr. Knight um, doing some studies with cats and vegan cat food. Uh, that was also really worth a read uh, as well. So I think we've covered everything. Is there anything else you feel like we've maybe left out? For everyone? I think we, yeah. we've done it. <laughs> we've done it. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us for Beat Around the Barn. Um, we'll put all of the show notes, um, links in the show notes. And um, and of course, there are some really great studies that Alice brought up from um, Dr. Knight uh, regarding cats and studies they've done on feeding them different types of food. So we'll make sure all of that is included in there. And we really do want to hear from you as well in, uh, in the comments. And and we wish uh, the best possible life for you and your animals.